All right, I'm excited because we're starting something brand new. This is going to be a verse-by-verse study through the Gospel of Mark. It'll be a series. We go through the whole Gospel of Mark verse-by-verse from beginning to end, Uh, but it might be a little bit different than stuff that you're used to or that you might be expecting. So I thought I should just start by explaining like the format. How are we going to go through the Gospel of Mark together? And we're going to focus on sort of four different things as we go through the Gospel of Mark. And the four things are, one, understanding it in detail. Um, What I mean is I'll be looking at cultural context. We'll look at detailed first century insights as we're looking at the the discussions between Jesus and, say, a Pharisee or something like that. We'll look at content from history or archaeology. Um, But most importantly, we'll look at the context of the verses, both in Mark as well as throughout the the whole Gospel of Mark, right in the passage, the, the whole Gospel, and then through it other passages in the scriptures. So it'll be a lot of contextual analysis stuff. Uh, Number two, that's the first thing. Number two, and this, you expect these things, right? Number two is good theology. Uh, I I want, obviously I don't ever plan on teaching bad theology, but but I intended to do good, careful theology, which means I'm willing to go like deep on an issue that comes up in the text. We might be kind of working through a passage and come across an idea and say, hey, let's let's evaluate this even more carefully. Let's, let's look at other scriptures. Let's do a systematic analysis of this issue that we have here coming up in Mark. So sometimes we might take a topic and do a little detour on that topic that we launched from the Gospel of Mark. Um, I think that good theology, it exalts God and in and of itself is like an act of worship. As we just study and do good theology, we're like loving God with our minds when we do that. And I'm, that's exciting to me. Looking forward to doing that. Also, number three, So one is understanding in detail. The second is good theology. Number three is applying it rightly. Again, you probably expect this one. Um, Whether it's encouragement or correction, we're going to try to take and apply these things into our our actual lives, which means that we're going to sometimes confront areas where either our culture or just the habits we've developed in our lives are being confronted with the teachings of Jesus, in which case we're not going to ignore that. We're going to focus on that. We're going to highlight that. We're going to be like, yeah, this is what I need, Lord. Correct me fix me. Um, that I'm also excited excited about. So in spite of whatever there may be popular teaching on an issue, or if it might be popular practice on an issue, but it just seems clearly this is what God's telling us. We're going we're gonna to try and let that change the way we live. Um, number four, and this might be the part that's a little bit different about this Bible study than other studies through Mark that you may have been to, and that's apologetics. Apologetics, most of you guys know, is defending the Christian faith. That's one way of putting it. But it's kind of giving a, a, a why to the what we believe. It's like, here's what I believe. Well, here's, here's, here's support for the truthfulness of those things. So answering skeptics' challenges and defending the truthfulness of the Christian worldview, particularly in the Gospel of Mark. So there's popular claims right now in universities, as well as online, all over online, things like, oh, Mark gets his geography wrong. So whoever wrote it, they couldn't have known anything about the geography of ancient Israel. Um, Or they'll say that Mark got Jewish customs completely wrong. Bart Ehrman, who's always my like skeptic that I point to for some reason. Uh, Bart Ehrman, he says this, that Mark got Jewish customs completely wrong and it proves that the author of Mark didn't even know any Jews really, certainly not how they lived. Um, He's uh, he's utterly false on this, but I want to like unpack that as we come across the passages he would sort of pick on to make that point. Um, Some people would say that Jesus isn't seen as God in Mark. Well, as we're going through Mark, we're going to highlight some of the things in Mark that talk about the deity of Christ. Um, Or some people would say that Mark didn't even write the Gospel of Mark. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the authorship of Mark and where it came from. So for some people, like of these four things, some of them are more relevant to you or more interesting to you. Some are just, I just want want the application, Mike, or I just want the theology, or I just want the apologetics. Um, So this means that sometimes the study will be more apologetic focused and you'll be like, I'm not as excited or I am more excited. Another time it's just verse by verse teaching, just simply walking through the text like what everybody's used to. I would encourage you to, you know, stick with me through the whole series because it's going to be all good and needful and useful information, even if it's not always your favorite thing. Today, we're focused on apologetics. Next week, we'll be all verse by verse simple teaching. Um, So... By the end, I think you should have a better grasp of what Mark meant in context, the passages in context, really understanding it in detail. Number two, the theology that we're learning from the Gospel of Mark. Number three, how to live it out in your life. And number four, the fact that it's true. You should have a better grasp of that as well. Also, for the sake of the study in Mark, I'm going to be using the New American Standard Bible. So it'll be the NASB for for this series. That'll be the one I'm using this time. 
Um, generally, we'll put out, for those watching online, we'll put this a new video out once a week, and it will come out um, de generally on Mondays. I'll try to push, push it out earlier in the day on Monday, um, unless for some reason I'm not doing the Sunday service um, for whatever reason, because of it's Mother's Day comes up or something like that. Usually we make that a family day instead of a, a gathering day. So there's occasional times where we won't, but more, than, more often than not, it'll be once a week on YouTube Mondays. Um, so here's what we're doing today. Who wrote Mark and is it based on eyewitness testimony? Now, if you're raised up in the church, you're going to be like, Mark wrote it and yes. And your answer is correct. But that answer will be challenged and attacked by people. And so I'm going to deal with building the case because there's a good case. And I like good cases for the truthfulness of the scriptures. <clears throat> so, the authorship of Mark. And I'm indebted to uh, Tim McGrew and Richard Bauckham, two different scholars who've done a lot of work that I borrowed from and learned from in prep prepping for this, among others. Um, so, we're talking about just Mark, not all of the Gospels. And we're going to talk about what scholars call the quality of being genuine, the genuineness of Mark. When they say, is a document genuine, what they mean is, um, is it written by the person to whom it was attributed? People think this person wrote it, did they really write it? Then they call it genuine. That's what that means. So what you'll hear from everyone, it seems nowadays, is that all the gospels are anonymous and nobody knows who wrote them. And they were published anonymously. And the names that you see on your Gospels were added way later, like so long after that nobody knew who really wrote them. Um, I'll quote Bart Ehrman here. Bart Ehrman says, uh, Some books, such as the Gospels, had been written anonymously, only later to be ascribed to certain authors who probably did not write them, apostles and friends of the apostles. He wrote that in his book, Jesus Interrupted, where he interrupts Jesus a lot. Um, Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, who we all know is a great Bible scholar, no, actually, he's, no, he's not. But Richard Dawkins says, nobody knows who the four evangelists were, but they almost certainly never met Jesus personally. He wrote that in his book, The God Delusion, where he said a lot of other things that were, well, delusional. Um, it's interesting, though, because the implication is that if you can't even trust who wrote it, that you're supposed to cast doubt upon the text itself. And it's, it's kind of like a sideways way to get you to maybe doubt the scripture. Um, so I'm not dealing with the doctrine of inspiration here. I believe the, God, the, the, the Bible is inspired by God and it's been given to us through human authors. And if we were to find out that someone other than Mark wrote it, it really wouldn't affect me that much, to be honest. I would be like, oh, we put the wrong name on the top of the book. Like it wouldn't actually impact this all that much, to be honest. But it's still interesting and it's still worth looking at and thinking about. So we're going to talk about this today. Um, the chief argument here for that Mark didn't write Mark is that it was originally anonymous, and we're going to talk about the historical case externally and internally for how we got the information in the Gospel of Mark. Because what they won't tell you, while, while you're reading Mark, if you read through the 16 chapters, and the skeptics will point this out, it never does he say, and I, Mark, wrote this Gospel. It doesn't say that. That's true. What they won't tell you, though, is that this was like a standard way of writing a historical work at the time. It was just normal. You don't write your name in the middle of the text and say, I'm the guy writing this. Let me give you some examples. Plutarch, Plutarch, he wrote 50 biographies, never mentioned his own name in 50 biographies. So we don't doubt that Plutarch wrote them. They wouldn't challenge that because that's not scripture. And there's like sometimes a double standard when it comes to the Bible. Plato's writings, anonymous. They're anonymous. How do you know Plato wrote those? Well, because of the historical attribution to Plato that's always been attributed to Plato. So we, we go, then it's Plato. This is pretty simple. Plato, not Plato. That's Porphyry also wrote anonymously. Clement of Rome, he wrote anonymously. He doesn't write in, now maybe on the top of the manuscript, he might have wrote from Clement or something, but not in the text itself. They wrote anonymously. It was standard to have works that were anonymous back then, especially if they were historical in nature. If you were trying to say, I'm writing history, you didn't want to be like putting yourself in the story because it seemed to dehistoricize it, like as if it was more of a story and not history. That's the idea. E.P. Sanders, he said, the claim of an anonymous history was higher than that of a named work in the ancient world. An anonymous book, rather like an encyclopedia article today, implicitly claimed complete knowledge and reliability meaning it's just fitting. You, you wouldn't expect him to write his name into it like that. It's their way of standing back and saying, hey, this is re what really happened. It's not just my opinion. That's the nature of this sort of anonymity 
when you're looking in the text. But now we'll look at some external evidence. So the first point is that whole, well, it doesn't have his name. It doesn't mean a lot. And it doesn't mean a lot applied to other things. Well, all of a sudden it's a big deal with the Bible because people want to have double standards sometimes. So external evidence. Um, you might ask, why do, why do we think Mark wrote it anyway? Why is it that the church is kind of around the world? It's just, they all believe Mark wrote it. You think, well, it's because it's written right there. As I open the thing, it's the gospel according to Mark. Except why is it written there? Why in translations across different countries and different lands is it all written, uh, the gospel according to Mark? How did it come to be written that way in the first place? Well, if we go back in time, you know, mentally, not literally, if we go back in time and we get to the third century, actually about 207 AD, 207 AD, so within 200 years of the time of Christ, we get to a guy named Tertullian of Carthage. Tertullian of Carthage, he talked about who wrote the gospel of Mark. So this isn't coming so long after. And he says... Um, while that gospel which Mark published may be affirmed to be Peter's whose interpreter Mark was. So Tertullian, he says that Mark was written by who? Mark. And he gives us more information. He says that it's the record of what Peter taught. So Mark was the penman. Peter was the source of the information. So he also tells us how long this has been known, if you read through what Tertullian wrote about it. He says that Mark and the other three Gospels have carried the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from the beginning. That's what Tertullian says. So he's like, this isn't even a new idea. This isn't people assigning names later, at least according to Tertullian, it's always been that way. That's kind of a big deal. He also tells us about their usage. Tertullian also says that the churches planted by the apostles, like, like the church in Corinth, there's churches that were planted by the apostles themselves. They have vouched for these four gospels and they have been read in these churches and no other gospels were read in the churches. While some would want to make it sound like there were these battles of the gospel battles going on, they radically overstated. There were some false gospels written, that's for sure. Uh, but they were not received in the church the way people act like they were. Just these four were read and used and the churches who knew the apostles vouched that these were apostolic in origin. So that kind of matters. Do you think they cared that the teaching that they continued was the teaching they had originally received? I think so. I think it mattered to them. So it's interesting too is uh, Tertullian, when he talks about this in 207 AD, he's not actually building a case for us for this. He's using it as a known fact against a heretic named Marcion. And so Marcion, he hated the Jews and he hated Judaism and he, he threw away the gospels except for Luke. He edited Luke and took out anything in it that he thought looked Jewish and then he published his own gospel, his own version of Luke, with no name on it. He just published it like, yeah, that's, this is a new gospel. <laughs> so this is kind of like he's trying to rewrite history. And so Tertullian's like, hey, oh, come on. Look at this fool over here. We've, we've all been reading and knowing these four gospels from time immemorial. It's always been this way. And so his, Marcion never got off the ground with his, with his silliness. It just didn't work. Um, now, if we go back up even more, let's back up another 20 or so years to the time of about 180 AD, and we have Clement of Alexandria. Clement of Alexandria, he tells us that Mark wrote his gospel by request from his knowledge of Peter's preaching at Rome. Let me read to you the, uh, the quote here. This is in uh, Eusebius, uh, who's an early church historian, and he says that Clement said the following, and so great a joy of light shone upon the minds of the hearers of Peter that they were not satisfied with merely a single hearing or with the unwritten teachings of the divine gospel. But with all sorts of entreaties, they besought Mark, who was a follower of Peter and whose gospel is extant to leave behind with them in writing a record of the teaching passed on to them orally. And they did not, did not cease until they had prevailed upon the man and so became responsible for the scriptures, for the scripture, for reading in the churches. So we learned that actually in the early church, it's the gospels and then the Jewish scriptures that were being read. It was the prophets and the gospels they referred to. Really interesting. So in this ancient book, Clement refers to this tradition as being handed down from the elders from the beginning, which is a really important phrase. Because the elders would have been the church leadership, not just random people in the church. Look what I found, a piece of paper. And writes Mark on it, you know. Rather, this has been going on from the beginning, and it started while Peter was still alive doing his thing. Irenaeus of Lyon, in about 180, around the same time, he was a bishop in France. So we went, now we're going from Alexandria to France. Around the same time, though. He wrote in a, in a book, a work called Against Heresies, actually book three, chapter one, he wrote the following. Peter and Paul proclaimed the gospel in Rome and founded the community. 
After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, handed on his preaching to us in written form. So he says, again, Mark was a disciple and interpreter of Peter, and he handed down the gospel that Peter had preached. Uh, side note, the function of the written gospel, if we catch why it was written, was to replace the preaching of the apostles after they were gone. The whole idea behind the gospels was that we couldn't change the information. And since we could no longer access the apostles, we needed it written down. That was the idea. And um, that seems to be what, what exactly has happened. So back up some more. Justin Martyr, in about 150 AD, he had in his work Dialogues with Trypho. His dialogue with Trypho was like a, an, a debate, a written debate where he's recording uh, complaints against Christianity and his responses to them. So in chapter 103, he says, For in the memoirs, which I say were drawn up by his apostles and those who follow them, it is recorded that, this, that his sweat fell down like drops of blood while he was praying and saying, If it, po if it be possible, let this cup pass. Justin Martyr refers to the memoirs of the apostles the memoirs, the memories of the apostles, and then he quotes Luke. How interesting, right? He also goes on to talk about how one of these memoirs of the apostles is the memoir, memoirs of Peter. Interesting. Now, if you go back to the, the one I quoted earlier, uh, chapter 103, he says, in the memoirs, which I say were drawn up by his apostles and those who followed them. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We had Two of them were apostles. Two of them were those who followed them. So he seems to be referring to these exact ones. And of course, he goes on to quote from these different books. Um, he actually quotes one of the memoirs specifically, and he says this, Justin Martyr. It is said that he, Jesus, changed the name of one of the apostles to Peter, and it is written in his memoirs that he changed the names of others, two brothers, the sons of Zebedee, to Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Now, anybody have an idea of what, what gospel we have the names changed to Sons of Thunder? Mark. That's in the gospel. So he's quoted, he's quoted Luke. He's quoted Mark. He says it's the memoirs of the apostles written down by either the apostles or those who followed them. So only Mark has that information. So these are the memoirs he's talking about. When he says the memoirs of Peter, he's referring, it seems, to the gospel of Mark. Uh, further, Justin Martyr, he had a student of his named Tatian who, brought up, who wrote the first harmony of the gospels. He ever take the four and try to bring them together. And it's called the Diatessaron. Diatessaron. Interesting. It sounds like some sort of like bad guy in a Marvel movie. But the Diatessaron is, uh, it means through the four. That's the, the word meaning. Through the four. And what sources did he use to bring all the gospels together? He used Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No others. There's no battle going on here, right? He used Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and no others. And he compiled them and brought them together. So the student of Justin Martyr knew it was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Justin Martyr seems to be talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He quotes Luke. He quotes Mark. He refers to it as the memoirs of Peter. Not the book of, but the memoirs of Peter. It's really interesting. Let's back up more. That's 150, right? Let's back up more. Let's go to 125 AD. We're getting pretty close with 125 AD. And we have Papias of Hierapolis. So we're going to go to Hierapolis, which is like Asia Minor. Um, he worked to gather information about Jesus and to make sure it was accurate by tracing it to the apostolic sources. So he would interview witnesses and compare what they said about Jesus and try to make sure it went back to the right sources. In particular, he got some stuff from John the Elder, who was a disciple of Christ. So he had, he had been, uh, when he, in his younger years, because he wrote in 125, but he was interviewing these people in the 80s, most likely it seems. So that would have been when John was still alive, one of the oldest living apostles. So here's what he tells us about the stuff he learned uh, probably in the first century. He says, the gospel was pinned by a guy named Mark. Not only is it Mark, but it's Mark that traveled with Peter. He quotes 1 Peter 5.13 to support this. Let me read to you 1 Peter 5.13. She who's in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends, gre sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Now, a lot of commentators think that uh, Babylon here is a reference to Rome. Um, because as Babylon had had the Jews under subjection to the Jewish mind, it's like they're the new Babylon, there's, they have us under subjection. And so that may be very well be that he was in Rome writing that. That's quite possible. And there he is with Mark. How interesting. Further, Peter is the chief source, not Mark. That's what also Papias tells us. He tells us that Mark's role was to help improve Peter's Greek. Not that Peter didn't know Greek, but that if, if you know more than one language, you may not necessarily be able to write well in more than one language. 
And it seems as though it was to make sure that it was, he was going to communicate that. And Mark has signs of Hebrew uh, or Aramaic, uh, Greek, and Latin influences, which would be interesting as you have Mark and Peter both being involved in the production of it. Plus, there's good reason, again, to think Peter knew Greek uh, because he was a fisherman in a largely Gentile area. Part of the Sea of Galilee was not Gentile, but a large part of it was, and he's doing business dealings with them on a regular basis. Um, and we have, we have the, 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 the sign on the cross written in multiple languages. We have a lot of reasons to think that there was a, a lot of multilinguality. Is that a word? Multilinguality. That sounds good. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Um, going on back then, just like nowadays when you go to any country where there's there's mixed populations, you know, you learn you learn a few words, right? Dios te bendiga, right? Like you learn to say a few, did I even say that right? Probably not. Maybe. You learn to say a few words. Um, we also know this, uh, that Josephus, who was a Jewish historian in the first century, um, he was a very intelligent man and he knew various languages, but when he wrote in Greek, although he knew Greek, he would use secretaries to help improve his Greek just to make sure that it came out the way he wanted it. And so again, we have good reason to think that Peter would have a reason to use Mark. Um, and it also makes sense as to why he was traveling with them in the first place. May have been able to help iron those things out. Because Peter was at that point in Rome ministering to a lot of sort of not as Jewish Jewish people, the Hellenized Jewish people that were Greek speakers. So he may have wanted that help. So remember that Justin Martyr called the four gospels the memoirs of the apostles, right? This is not merely an issue of who penned them, but of where the content came from. Um, another interesting fact is Papias reports that this is what John the Elder said, that John the Elder gave him this info about Mark, which traces it back even further. Um, and John, of course, knew Peter, so this seems pretty strong. Now, someone could say, well, how do I know he didn't make that up? How do I know that we're all just not brains in a vat, and that this whole thing's just, the world wasn't made five minutes ago. And if, you could always ask those kinds of questions. But the point is that the, the, uh, the historical record seems to clearly indicate one clear answer. Now, what's also interesting is the geography of these guys. So if I just took four of them, Tertullian, he's in Carthage. Carthage is about 1,100 miles from the next one, Clement in Alexandria, Egypt. Go another 500 miles north, if you go by boat, if you go by land, it's 1,500 miles, and you get to Papias or Papias in Hierapolis. Then you can go another 1,800 miles, and you're going to get to Irenaeus in France. And I'm not going sideways here. We're going in a, uh, in a square to get to all these people. These are the four corners of the Roman Empire, very much. Um, they had no social media. They didn't have a postal system going on. They didn't have phone calls. Hey, I'm going to write down that Peter wrote that, you know, this stuff wasn't going on, but rather it's spread out as the church spread very quickly and churches were planted all over the place. The knowledge that Mark's gospel is read in the churches, received in the churches, and that it's Mark's and that it came through the preaching of Peter is kind of a consistent thing. So now I want to share with you the historical sources that say that Mark actually wasn't written by Mark. The historical sources that tell us that Mark wasn't written at all by Mark and that it wasn't written at Peter, uh, from Peter's data or with him as a source. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something else because there's none of those, right? There's not a single one in history who challenged Mark's authorship until like over 300 years later. And those who are responding are like, hello, everybody knows Mark wrote this book. Like, this is silly. So that's in about 400 A.D., where it gets challenged, where it finally is challenged. After all these people were dead and gone that I just quoted to you. And we have a debate between two guys, Augustine and Faustus. Faustus, he's the bad guy, boo, right? Augustine, he's the good guy. And Augustine, he's a Christian theologian and philosopher. Faustus was a knucklehead. And Faustus, uh, he was a critic of Christianity. He, he wanted to criticize and attack Christianity. And one of the things he attacked was the Gospels. So again, about 400 AD, first time uh, someone's questioning the authorship of the Gospels, and Augustine has a written debate with Faustus. You could actually go and read it. So he asks the following questions. He's like, it's strange, you know, that Faustus is challenging the authorship of the Gospels because we don't do this with any other historical works. You know, they were smart back then. They weren't all, like some people just think in history, everybody was dumb. Sometimes I read them and I think we're dumb um, when I read their stuff. And he goes, we don't do this with other historical works. Nobody doubts the genuineness of the books attributed to Hippocrates, Augustine says. And then he talks about why. 
He says, because there's a succession of testimonies to the books from the time of Hippocrates to the present day, which makes it unreasonable either now or hereafter to have any doubt on the subject. How do we know the authorship of the works of Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Varro, and other similar writers, but by the unbroken chain of evidence? Augustine's saying, look, it's been from time immemorial. We've all known who wrote these books. If you're going to say that you're not going to trust them, you can't trust any other historical works. But this is so often what happens with, with skeptics I, that I experience. They have double standards. Oh, I, I, I'll take Hippocrates. Oh, I'll take Cicero. But the Bible, nope. Standards like way up here. Where is it? I don't know, somewhere up in the clouds? Just trust me, you can't reach it. And it becomes this sort of unreasonable um, skepticism against the scriptures. So, that's the external evidence. Is it genuine? Well, it sure seems like it. And by any normal historical standards, you would consider Mark to be the author of Mark. But you still have guys like Bart Ehrman saying, they're anonymous. They were originally published with nothing written upon them. Well, we actually don't know that they were originally published with nothing written on them. We don't know that. That's just something he says. Let me move on. Well, okay, before I get to the internal evidence, I'll talk about the, what the, write, the writing, the names of the Gospels from the beginning uh, of Mark, but um, I have some more stuff here that I just forgot about. So, early writers quote Mark um, also. This is separate from like Tertullian and these other guys. We have early writers that are quoting from Mark. We, we have a large number of them. It would take all day to go through them all. But why this matters is because they seem to expect their readers to believe the authoritative nature of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, just these specific four Gospels. They don't quote from the heretical ones. The Gospel of Thomas, they're not quoting from, right? The, the Gospel of, of Judas, they're certainly not quoting from. They're rejecting those. In fact, the people who do quote from, from them tend to be the heretics that get kicked out of the church. And, and they quote from them, why? Because they wrote them, you know, because they're trying to, to push these up onto the church. Even the heretics, though, like guys like Celsus, who wrote against the Christians in the second century, he says, I've, I've made all these accusations against you, and I did it using only your own books. And he only quotes from the four Gospels as far as any other Gospels. So, so the usage of Mark from the very beginning is kind of a big deal. The fact that the early church utterly rejected these other Gospels means that they cared about the, the genuineness of the writings themselves. There's one other line of reasoning, too, and it's this. If you're going to make a, a, an author, you have this anonymous work, and it's about Jesus. And like, could you imagine, you have this scroll, and it's a copy of the Gospel of Mark, and, and you look at it and you go, I wonder who wrote it. Like you wouldn't have any way of knowing. You didn't ask when somebody handed it to you when you copied it across. It didn't originally have anything written on it. That's the idea that they give. But, um, but, it, but if you're going to assign a name here and you want this Gospel to have authority, whose name are you going to put on it? Peter. Peter. Yeah, man, Peter. Thomas. Right? One of those guys, Andrew, James, somebody, not Mark, Mark, who's that guy, right? Oh, yeah, oh, he traveled with the apostles. Okay, okay, no, I read about him. And, you know, Paul wrote about, his, about Mark. He ditched him in act. Okay, Mark ran away and Paul wouldn't even take him back. And then later on, Paul's like, okay, we're reconciled. Bring Mark, he'll be useful to me. We know Mark traveled with Peter in 1 Peter. We know that as well. But, uh, but you wouldn't put Mark on there. It just doesn't make sense. Like the most reasonable, simple explanation is it's attributed to Mark and not Peter because it was Mark that wrote it. it. That's the simple, this is, sometimes common sense is not allowed in biblical criticism. <laughs> but the internal evidence, that's external evidence. Now let's look at internal evidence. Every copy of Mark we have found that has the beginning or end intact where it would have the, the name of the work on it, the beginning and end, every single copy it has the attribution that it is the gospel according to Mark, all the copies that we have available to us. We've never found one without that on it. Okay, that matters. You know, if, if they were assigning names later, you'd expect different names on different copies. Okay, in, in, in France, they, somebody wrote this. In Egypt, someone wrote this. It's Peter's gospel here. It's somebody else's gospel over here, but it's always Mark. But there's another interesting thing about the naming of Mark. It's the gospel according to Mark, which is odd. That's not the, the title you normally would put on a, on a book. Normally, books had the author's name first and then the book title next. So Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Poetics. You put the author's name and then, you, then the name of the book. But here it's the gospel according to Mark. Now, as Christians, you're like, I know why they did that. You know, because <laughs> the gospel is more important than the Mark. But, 
but that's, um, that's what we see. And we see it consistently. Again, if you were ma- even if everyone was making up Mark titles, why would they all write it the same way? Why wouldn't they do the standard Mark's gospel instead of the gospel according to Mark? So it's consistency there. There's also inside the writings itself, inside of the gospel of Mark, the internal evidence, there is evidence of what they call a Petrine perspective, or, it, or the idea that Peter seems to have been influencing the writing of this work. And so this is where you get into some pretty like detailed theories and things like that. And I'm, what I'm sharing with you here right now is uh, from the work of a scholar named Richard Bauckham, and he wrote a, an extensive book on the topic called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. It's a very interesting book. It's pretty accessible as far as scholarly books go. It's very accessible. It doesn't mean you won't have to read the same stuff over and over again, but it's pretty good. Um, he says that at the beginning of, of Mark and at the end of Mark, we have something called an inclusio. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but let me tell you what an inclusio is. An inclusio is the idea behind an inclusio, according to Richard Bauckham, is an ancient technique of showing who your eyewitnesses are without breaking your story. So you're sharing the, the history here, and you want to you tell people, I have an eyewitness source. But you don't want to say, I'm going to stop the story. Jesus went here, and by the way, everybody who's reading this, this person here is one of my sources. And then he continues the story. They don't want to do that. So they would just use an inclusio. The inclusio is like having the person's name at the beginning and the person's name at the end of the work. It's like they're at the beginning, they're at the end. They have a prominent, specific kind of role. And uh, Bauckham uh, points to other ancient works that do this as well to try to build a case for it. If you're interested, you could check out his book. But get the second edition one, because in his second edition of Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, Richard Bauckham responds to critics who think he's wrong. Because he is coming against a lot of scholarship here. But I think he rightly demonstrates why a lot of the scholarship is just assuming things that isn't isn't evidence. Um, So you put them at the bookends. Now, if you look at Mark 1.16 we actually have the first mention of Peter. Mark 1.16, it says, And as he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. He also notes that Simon's, Simon and Peter, same guy, that his name is mentioned twice right there. Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon. So he has his name twice. In the Greek, it's in there twice. In some translations, they just put it once because it's awkward. Why not just say, and Andrew, his brother. Then at the end of Mark, in Mark 16.17, it says, uh, the angel tells the women, go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And we have the disciples and Peter. And Peter is mentioned there. And it seems slightly odd. Why and Peter? I mean, is Peter one of the disciples? Yes, clearly. There's some other reason why and Peter is being mentioned here. You can get in more into that. This is just one argument. It's not the whole case for the internal stuff on Peter. I'll share some other things now, though, and I'll let Richard Bauckham explain the rest. If you're interested in that, you can check it out. He might have something online that you can find as well if you don't want to buy the book. Um, Also, there's more stuff. Peter is referenced in Mark uh, more frequently than in any other gospel. His name, Peter. He seems to be referenced. He seems to have a special place in the gospel of Mark. Um, Notice here in a couple passages, it's Peter who speaks, uh, and Jesus answers to a group. And this this uh, Richard Bauckham thinks is implying that it's Peter's perspective we're seeing in the story. As Mark takes what story, the story that Peter would tell as first person, I did this, or we did this, and then Jesus did this, and he's, tra- and he's changing it to, um, uh, to, to not carry that first person pronoun, you know, when Peter wrote it. Uh, in Mark 11, verse 20, it says, um, And here I I unintentionally quote from the ESV, but here it is. Uh, As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away at its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. And it's this, Peter says to him, and Jesus answered them. And it's just interesting. It's different than it comes in Matthew. In Matthew, the same instance, it reads different. It's not Peter remembered and Jesus answered to them. Instead, it says, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? This is Matthew 21, verse 20 and 21. So, and Jesus answered them, and he explains the withering of the fig tree. So, we have this, um, this thing. In Mark, it's Peter asks, Jesus answered them. In Matthew, it's they asked, and Jesus answered them. It's just less from his perspective, it seems. So, these are little hints, There's, and you add these up. The point is you walk through these, and you try to add them up. 
here's a, another example um, where Peter just has an interesting place in the, in the telling of the story. Keep in mind that Peter and Andrew, or Simon and Andrew, they're brothers, and they're both at their house in this case. In Mark 135, it says, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was found praying there, or was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. It's just interesting. It's like Simon and his companions, they searched. If you look at, why is it Simon and his companions? I mean, they were the disciples, right? Why, why isn't the disciples went to go look for him? So you can almost like hear Peter telling the story, um, but presumably Andrew, James, and John are there as well. Also at the transfiguration, we have another potential indication of this. This is in Mark 9, verse 5 and 6. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's, let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, for he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. And um, here's where Richard Bauckham says, it's like you can almost hear Peter telling it. it doesn't seem to be, he doesn't seem to be speaking for the group here. He doesn't have a role as the announcer for the group. It's just, and, you're, and I said this. You can almost hear it coming off of him. Is this, is this ironclad? No, 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 no. It's implications. We're just saying, hmm, interesting. Interesting. When we add this to the other evidence that Peter may have been a source, then it becomes even more interesting because it's consistent with the external evidence. Now, other people in Mark that are named, you never read Mark like this, right? You don't read it going like, let me examine the names in the Gospel of Mark. Like, you never do this, but you can learn some cool things from it. So other named persons in Mark can strengthen this case. Most of those who are healed in Mark, they don't have names. He just heals people. Jesus just heals people, but occasionally we get names. For instance, in Mark 10, we don't just have a blind man. We have a blind man named Bartimaeus. Why does this guy have a name? Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Why him? Why does he have a name? Well, Richard Bauckham's case in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses is that he thinks that the occurrence of names, and he walks through this very carefully, gives a bunch of examples that I don't have time to do tonight, but he, he basically says, hey, I think that this name was there because to the community that was listening to the gospel originally, they knew Bartimaeus. And so they're like, oh yes, and Bartimaeus was there. So then they mention his name. Whereas when they're mentioning some people that are, they're not named, well, they weren't accessible to the community, so there's no point in giving their names. There's other examples, and this one's maybe a little better. Mark 15, 21, we hear about Alexander and Rufus for seemingly no reason. Let me read to you the, the, the verse. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Okay, I get why Simon might be named. Maybe he's known to the community. Maybe that's part of the reason. But Alexander and Rufus, his kids, why are they named? Why does Mark bother giving them names? Tradition says that Mark was written where? Remember I read you those quotes? Where do they say that Mark was written? In Rome. In Rome, okay, so this, this gospel being written in Rome at their, at their request. In Romans, when Paul writes to Rome, he greets a guy named Rufus. Let me read it to you. Or I, I, I won't read it to you. Take that. It's in Romans 16. I just didn't write down the first. <laughs> I thought I feel so bad. Um, so it's not a surprise that Mark would bring Rufus into the story if that same guy was now in the church in Rome. And so he's like, oh, Yes, and Simon of Cyrene, he, he was compelled to carry Jesus' cross, and he's the father of Alexander and Rufus, because that community knew those guys, and they were following Jesus at that time. So it could be that Rufus, who was from Rome at that point in time, um, uh, he's able to say, yep, I was there. I, I remember my dad telling me about that event. I remember my dad telling me how he was, he was upset about it, or he, you know, who knows? Who knows? So interesting stuff. There's, there's more about Rufus as well and stuff like that, but I'll move forward. Um, um, this, is, this is not iron-clad proof where we're putting pieces of the puzzle together and we're going, they all seem to be consistent with the same idea. So it's especially strong, though, this usage of names when Peter's out of the story. Again, another reason why Peter or the disciples, they're no longer in the story, and now these names come up because it's like Mark is telling you, here's my sources for this information while the disciples were gone. Do you guys know when the disciples were not around in an important time in Jesus' ministry? Yeah. Oh, the woman at the well. That would be an interesting one. Yeah, that would be in John, though. Um, 
But there's another time, an even more important time in Jesus' ministry. It was at his crucifixion. And remember what Peter did? He denied Christ and then he left weeping. And he's not around. The next time he enters the story, Jesus has already risen. So where's, where's Mark getting his data? And is he going to tell us? And you know who he brings into the story very carefully at that point? The women. The women. And this is really interesting stuff. They're present, not just uh, randomly, but they're present at the cross, at the burial of Jesus, and then at the discovery of the empty tomb in particular. And the women are Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and Joseph, that's her kids, and Salome. And then at the, at the burial, that was at the cross, at the burial, it's the two of them, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph. And then at the empty tomb, it's the three again. Interesting how Mark brings these women in at that, just that point. And they're not just around. They're not just present. They're present doing one particular thing. If you read the verses where these women show up at these pivotal moments, the, 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 the burial, um, the, the crucifixion, the burial, and, and then the um, empty tomb discovery, and you look at the verses, you'll see that they're functioning as witnesses in Mark's gospel in particular. So Mark 15, 40, it says, there were also some women looking on from a distance and among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the less, and Joseph and Salome. They're, they're, they're literally a whole verse with names listed. And the only thing he says is they were just watching as, the, as the, the body of Jesus was being taken. That's their job. They were just watching. Then in 1547, it says after the, the burial, right, that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking on to see where he was laid. The verbs are about them looking. They're looking on to see where he is laid, was laid. Then in 16 verse 4, it says, Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He's not here. Behold the place where he lay. And he invites them to check it out. They're functioning as witnesses, it seems. It seems to be their function here where the normal witness, Peter, and the disciples are not available. I think that's kind of neat. I think that's pretty interesting. And Richard Bauckham says that this, this study of names has been largely neg neglected in scholarship. They just don't even talk about it. They don't deal with it, uh, generally speaking. Now, some people would say, um, oh, come on. What if Mark just made up those names? And he just wants to make his story sound more real, right? Like, I'm going to put people's names in here to make it sound more real. We have a good reason to think that that is not what happened. Oh, I have a bunch of good reasons. For one, we have no historical works like this ever, like from the time. There's no historical work where someone does this, like, carefully constructed historical lie. Like, this just doesn't exist, right? We also have, as the later Gospels were written, they lose names. They don't add new names, Right? And then when they finally do start having much later gospels, false gospels, where they add new names, they add the wrong names. And that's where it gets exciting. There's, okay, this is not exciting, right? But this part's not exciting, but the results of it are exciting. Okay, there has been a study of Palestinian names from the time of Jesus. Looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, looking at the biblical texts, and then looking at ossuaries. Ossuaries is the number one source. The ossuaries are these like bone boxes they find in graves. And they look at them and they, they look at the names that are carved there and they go, this is the kind of things people were named back then. Like right now, nowadays, people don't have the same names as they used to. Have you noticed that? Like my, my, in my grandma's time, it was Norma, Dorothy were common names, right? I don't know any Dorothys now. So if someone tells a story from back then, they're going to try to pick period proper names. Well, there's no way. I mean, you couldn't Google period proper names from the 1930s. Like you can't do that in the first century. Mark seems to have period proper names. So let me explain. There's an Israeli scholar by the name of Tal Ilan, and she compiled this list of names, didn't, not for any sort of apologetic work or anything like that, but it's called The Lexicon of Jewish Names in Late Antiquity, and you're welcome to read it if you ever have insomnia. <laughs> what she found is that some names were extremely popular inside Israel, and yet different names were popular outside Israel. So even at the same time, different names, different popularity levels. Other ones were very rare. So Richard Bauckham, he took the work that she did, the research she did, and then she com and he compared leaving out the Gospels and just compare the Gospels' names to the names found in ossuaries in the Dead Sea Scrolls and to see what we get. And he found that the um, most popular names in the Gospels and Acts, the, the top number one name, anybody have an idea what it was? 
you're going to say Judas, but it wasn't Judas. No, it was, it was because there's a lot of Judas. Is Judas not Iscariot, remember? But there were, it was the most popular male name was Simon. Simon. Now, in the writings of also Josephus, his writings, we have a list of names as well. So in Josephus and in the ossuaries and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, we have Simon as one of the most popular names. It's number one in Josephus and the ossuaries. It's the second most popular name in the Dead Sea Scrolls content. Simon. Oh, it's period appropriate, isn't it? Um, then the second most popular name at the time was Joseph or Joseph. Same, same name. This is the second most popular in Josephus and the ossuaries, and it was barely the most popular edging out Simon in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In Alexandria, on the other hand, the second most popular Jewish boy name was not Joseph, it was Sabbateus or Sabbatias, because they just had different names, different areas, different names, different influences. They weren't the same. If you take the top nine names from these sources in the first, around the first century, it actually goes from before to a little after in that time. Um, if you take them in the top nine names, they, they include 41% of the names were these same nine names for boys. In the New Testament, 40% of the names we find are those names. The, it's not just the names, but the ratios of the names. And the, the more you, you pull in, the more you go, the gospels all together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, all of them together, it looks just exactly like it's real people from the first century, from within the time, or within uh, Palestine, within Israel. Um, the most popular uh, woman name, you already guessed it, Mary, right? Mary is, or some variation thereof, the most popular inside and outside uh, the New Testament in in Israel during that time. Now, if you take the popular versus unpopular stuff, you have to keep in mind something is that generally most scholars think three of the four gospels were written outside Palestine. Now, this may or may not be true, but this is the general thought. So outside Palestine, you're making stuff up and you're picking Jewish names for people. How on earth did you just happen to pick the right names for people inside Palestine or inside Israel? That's interesting, interesting stuff. They weren't invented. The point is they were remembered. They did not invent these names. They remembered them. They recalled them because these are just their real names. Um, also, they find when they study these ossuaries that the Bible gets right not only the right names, but gets right the way these names are differentiated. You see, there's a lot of Simons, but there, but there may not be a lot of another name. You know, So when I have a lot of the person with the same name, I start to have to add extra stuff at the end of that guy's name to know who he is. Simon the Tanner, Simon son of Jonah, Simon Peter. I add his Greek name with his, he, with his Hebrew name so that we can identify him better. And this, this is what the Gospels do. They take on the ossuaries, it, they, it'd be like Simon and then add more, right? It would add more stuff to these people's names, either their occupation, the city they were from, or their family name, a name of a father or something like that. This is what they would do. And this is what the Gospels do. They get this entirely right. Not only the way the names are differentiated, but which names needed to be differentiated because they were so common. It gets all this stuff right. So if you're going to say that the names were added by Mark because he was trying to spice up the story, it doesn't make sense. These seem like real names of real people and the ratios and the way they're identified tell us this is history. And normal historical analysis would have people nodding their heads. But when it's the Bible, sometimes people are like, but it's the Bible. We can't, we can't be like saying that that stuff's like true and stuff, you know, like, and that's... That's, their, that's on them. <laughs> I don't have a problem saying it's true. <laughs> None at all. Um, also, there's more evidence for the Gospel of Mark, and that is the Galilean familiarity that Mark has in particular. Peter would have been a fisherman in Galilee. He would have spent most of his time on the north shore of Galilee. And that's what Mark knows the most about in the writing of the Gospel of Mark. When he talks about areas outside that area of Galilee, that, that narrow area where the fishing and the life of the fishermen took place, it's like a vague reference. And they went over here. I mean, maybe Peter didn't know as much about that area. He visited it one time or two times or something. But if it's about that area of Galilee or the city of Jerusalem, there's more details in the Gospel of Mark. The implication is that, well, the author somehow knew stuff about Galilee. And we don't think that Mark was from there. This is coming from Peter or one of the fishermen disciples is what it seems. The details, the specific details. It's details that a first century fisherman would know and say. Uh, in fact, um, uh, it focuses specifically on the area where the fishermen did their jobs. So he wouldn't even go to the south of Galilee, typically speaking. They wouldn't even travel down there. 
Some will say that Mark's geography is wrong, but I'm going to deal with that as we move through the text. We'll come to a passage and I'll just unpack that and that'll be like the apologetics moment then. Um, but Mark focuses on the Galilean ministry of Jesus in particular. He's in Galilee a lot in the Gospel of Mark and less details and less time is spent when he's elsewhere. Uh, Richard Bauckham did a study on the geography of this and he said this, in conclusion, the world of Jesus' Galilean ministry, according to Mark, is the world of a Capernaum fisherman focused on and around the northern part of the Lake of Galilee. That's his study of the text. So this is just another little detail we add to our sort of cumulative case here that what we've been told about Mark is true about Mark. I think that's kind of a big deal. Add it all up, right? We have universal and early acknowledgement of Mark as the author and Peter as the source. We have statements from people with some reliability in, in the, not just random people, right? Church leaders, from various parts in various areas around the world of the time, we have the usage in the churches and in the writings of the early Christians, and we have internal indications of like a Peter-type perspective or Petrine perspective, um, and other indications that there are these sort of eyewitness indicators, like uh, the women. Well, if they're the eyewitnesses now, who were the witnesses before? And we have the inclusio with Peter and that kind of stuff. It's all just kind of adds up. And I think it's really interesting stuff. I think that what you may have taken for granted that Mark wrote the gospel of Mark is something that you should have taken for granted all along. And uh, next week, we're going to dig into, it'll be verse by verse study. <laughs> I won't be quoting church fathers. It'll be a verse by verse study. We'll be digging into the gospel of Mark and we're just going to plod our way through. And uh, God willing, we'll just have blessing after blessing as we dig through this book and let it change our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for um, not just giving us the scriptures, but giving us uh, the breadcrumbs that lead us to the scriptures. We, uh, we're grateful. Lord, we pray as we begin this venture, this study through the gospel of Mark, that it would change our lives, that we would see Jesus more clearly than ever before, that we'd understand his words better than ever before, that we would appreciate and be able to see the majesty that is the scriptures as we study it and be armed, Lord, that we might um, be bold in the truth and communicate these true things to other people. We, we pray for people who will be watching this series that maybe don't know you, and as they hear the words of Christ, that their lives would be tra changed, transformed, and they'd be saved. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, you just bless our study, bless us with wisdom and insight into your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen.